Cody. Come. Praise the Lord. Well, welcome to Bible study tonight. And um, of course, tonight we're coming to the last in our series, Growing Godly, and uh, our studies in the tabernacle. So tonight we'll be coming to the last study. Now, because it's the last study in the series, you'll notice some of the high priestly garments have been much shorter studies. Um, but because we're coming to the last study in the series, tonight will be mostly Bible study. And uh, we'll have a short time of prayer at the end. Um, but of course, we'll have more time to pray in our one-off study next week. And then the week after, on the bank holiday weekend, we're um, making the whole meeting a prayer gathering as well. So tonight is mostly Bible study because of the last in the series. But I'm sure you'll bear with us because this is a very important study. So Growing Godly, Part 22. And the title of tonight's study is The Cloud. And I'd like you to turn in your Bibles, please, to the book of Exodus and to chapter 40. Book of Exodus, chapter 40. And we are going to read uh, verses 1 to 16, and then we'll read down from verse 34. Exodus chapter 40. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, On the first day of the first month, you shall set up the tabernacle of the tent of meeting. You shall put in it the ark of the testimony and petition off the ark with the veil. You shall bring in the table and arrange the things that are to be set in order on it. And you shall bring in the lampstand and light its lamps. You shall also set the altar of gold for the incense before the ark of the testimony and put up the screen for the door of the tabernacle. Then you shall set the altar of the burnt offering before the door of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting. And you shall set the laver between the tabernacle of meeting and the altar and put water in it. You shall set up the court all around and hang up the screen at the court gate, and you shall take the anointing oil and anoint the tabernacle and all that is in it, and you shall hallow it and all its utensils, and it shall be holy. You shall anoint the altar of the burnt offering and all its utensils and consecrate the altar. The altar shall be most holy. And you shall anoint the laver and its base and consecrate it. Then you shall bring Aaron and his sons to the door of the tabernacle of meeting and wash them with water. You shall put the holy garments on Aaron and anoint him and consecrate him that he may minister to me as priest. And you shall bring his sons and clothe them with tunics. You shall anoint them as you anointed their father that they may minister to me as priests, for their anointing surely shall be an everlasting priesthood throughout all their generations. Thus Moses did, according to all that the Lord had commanded him, so he did. Move down to verse 34. Then the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tabernacle of meeting because the cloud rested above it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Whenever the cloud was taken up from above the tabernacle, the children of Israel would go onward in all their journeys. But if the cloud was not taken up, 
then they did not journey till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was above the tabernacle by day, and fire was over it by night, in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. Father, just bless your word to our hearts. Help me, Lord, to interpret it under your anointing, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as I said, we're coming to our last in the series, Growing Godly, of our studies in the tabernacle. We've looked at the furniture, the coverings, the priesthood, the craftsmen, and the high priestly garments. Now, tonight, we come to Exodus chapter 40, which is divided, really, into three sections. Firstly, verses 1 to 15, and there we have God giving his command to erect the tabernacle. Then from verses 16 to 33, uh, verses, well, we did read verse 16, but the other verses we didn't read, we find there in that section that Moses does exactly what the Lord had commanded him to do. We read seven times in this chapter that Moses did according to all, really, that the Lord had directed him. And then in this final section, we have from verses 34 to 38. And you'll notice it opens with the word then. And we must consider, therefore, what precedes it. That's why I read those earlier verses. But at the end of verse 33, we read, so Moses finished the work. And that's a reference to the construction of God's dwelling place on the earth. Now, the time taken to bring to the tabernacle to that stage was seven months. But yet, it could be set up and made ready for service in one day. But the work was finished. And we read at the beginning of this chapter that it was the first day of the first month. The first incense was burnt and the first sacrifice was offered. Moses, no doubt, had placed the table of showbread on the right and the candlestick on the left in the holy place. He had set the altar of incense before the veil. He had set, uh, washed the labor and had anointed it and all its vessels. The Ark of the Covenant had been placed in the most holy place. Aaron invested with his garments. And those who watched those proceedings take place and had engaged in them that day, were probably ready by this time, after erecting the tabernacle, to uh, go home for a rest in the evening. Even Moses himself had withdrawn and left the tabernacle precinct. But suddenly, a supernatural and a spectacular event happened before them. That we read of in verse 34. Then the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Now, this cloud that covered the tabernacle, the tent of the congregation, was the same cloud that we read of in chapter 13. It was the same cloud that had come between the camp of the Israelites and the camp of the Egyptians at the Red Sea. It was the same cloud uh, that covered the mount when Moses went up to receive God's revelation on Sinai. It was the same cloud that we read of in Exodus chapter 33 that descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle as God taught with Moses. But this cloud, you see, it was like no other cloud, because it was by this cloud that 
God manifested his presence to his people. It was a visible manifestation of the invisible God, a theophany, a word that comes from two Greek words, theos, meaning God, and phane, which means to show. And a manifestation of that cloud was a fulfillment of the whole purpose for which the tabernacle was built. If you can remember from earlier studies, in Exodus 25, verse 8, God had said to Moses, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. And here, by this cloud descending, God was honouring exactly what he said he was honoring in his word as he always does now in verses 34 to 38 of exodus 40 we have two tremendous truths really set side by side because first we see the truth of god's awesome majesty the one who is high and lifted up the one that uh, who is so holy and high, and that we call his transcendence, and we read of his glory. But second, side by side with that, we have the truth of God's nearness as he was dwelling among his people, and that's what we call God's imminence. We have that wonderful verse, you don't need to turn to it, in Isaiah 57 and verse 15, which tells those two wonderful truths together, God's transcendence and God's imminence, because we read this there, for thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. So God is transcendent. He's so high. He's so majestic. He's so awesome and so holy. And yet he chooses to dwell with people. One experience Israel had that night in the desert was when the cloud of glory descended upon the tabernacle and filled it. Now, tonight, as we draw this series to a close, as I said to you, we're calling the message The Cloud. And we're going to look at it under three headings. First of all, I want to consider with you that the cloud Fill the tabernacle with the glory of God. Now, the book of Exodus begins with a groan because the children of Israel, you know, are taken into Egypt. But it ends up with glory. And how fitting that is for a book whose central theme is redemption. You know, mankind, we began with a groan, a groan in our sin. But thank God, when we're saved, it ends in glory. And that's what we find here in this wonderful book. The cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting and the glory of God filled the tabernacle. You see, the glory of God, it was so great that Moses was not able to enter the tent of the congregation because the cloud abode thereof. You know, the same was true at the completion of Solomon's temple. Because if you turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 8, 1 Kings chapter 8, we will find there in chapter 8, in verses 10 and 11, it came to pass when the priest came out of the holy place, that the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priest could not continue ministering because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. 
the Apostle John observed the same thing of the heavenly sanctuary in the revelation that he was given. Because in Revelation chapter 15, Revelation chapter 15 and verse 8, says the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. You see, the presence of the Lord in all these occasions was manifested by the cloud, and it filled the tabernacle. It was a revelation of God's transcendent glory. And, you know, friends, as I was thinking about this, I thought it would be good to try and give a definition of the glory of God. But, you know, really, that is an impossible task. Ezekiel had a vision and a description of the glory of God in chapter 1 of his prophecy. And I know parts of Ezekiel are very hard to understand. But Ezekiel is doing the best he can in that chapter to describe the glory of God. And many people down the years have done their best to defy God's glory. But we must say that all definitions are far too short of the glory of what it really is. But I came across this one by one commentator, and this is one of many. And he said this, and remember, this is only a trap. But he said, the glory of God is the beauty and the perfection of his spirit. It's not an aesthetic beauty or a material beauty, but it is the beauty that emanates from God's character and from all that he is, the glory of God. Now, it's thought it's, it's that this cloud was made visible by light and fire, because we read in Scripture that God is light. And we also read in Scripture that our God is a consuming fire. And with this cloud, the holy place and the most holy place were filled with a brightness and a luster and a splendor. And yet, as in a previous theophany, the one at the burning bush, remember? Remember the burning bush when God appeared in the bush and it was not consumed? And so too, you see, this cloud, it was full of light, it was full of the brightness of God, and yet it was fire by night, and yet not one curtain in the tabernacle was cinched. Not one in the least by this cloud of glory. Now, if one can't look upon the sun in the sky, you know, the sunshine, without suffering, that's the sun in the sky, then it's easy to understand why the natural eye cannot bear to behold the brilliance of the Shekinah glory of God. The cloud which filled with the tabernacle is a picture of so many things. It's a picture of Christ, who the scripture says is the brightness of the Father's glory, and who filled the tabernacle. You know, he was one who at the same time dwelt in human nature and yet came to dwell among us. And in Christ, you see, we have the divine essence of the Godhead. The divine majesty dwells bodily. And even Saul, when he saw the risen Christ on the road to Damascus, he testified that the light of his glory, the risen Christ, the exalted Christ, it was above the brightness of the sun. 
Now, some believe that experience may be led Paul to having some damage to his eyesight. But you know, when John on the Isle of Patmos saw in a vision the glorified Christ, the Bible says he fell at his feet as dead. In Exodus 33, the book we're in, if you go back to chapter 33 of the book of Exodus, we have that um, particular request by Moses in verse 18 of chapter 33. He said, please show me your glory. You know, friends, man was created to be in God's presence. Man was created to behold God's glory. Let's not forget that. And yet, of course, we are fallen through sin. And therefore, God answered Moses this way. He said, you cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and live. And the Lord said, here is a place by me, and you shall stand on the rock. So it shall be, while my glory passes by, that I will put you in the cleft of the rock, and cover you with my hand while I pass by. You see, that underlines for us, folks, that flesh, as it is now, could not endure the unveiled perfections of the Godhead, the brilliance of God's glory. Friends, it would just annihilate us. It would blow us away because God is so high, he's so exalted. He's so lifted up, so glorious in his holiness that he cannot be experienced directly in his fullness by mortal man. God's glory was so overwhelming that not even Moses, who alone among the elders of Israel and had at times past drawn near to God, not even Moses could enter into the tabernacle when it was filled with the glory of God. This shows us how great and how terrible God's glory is and how unable the greatest and the best of men are to stand before God of themselves. And it reminds us, therefore, of our need for a mediator, the Lord Jesus Christ. Because if we are to experience communion with the one who is so high, and so holy, we need a mediator. Now, Moses couldn't enter in, in that he was weak through the flesh. But, friends, what Moses couldn't do, thank God it's been done for us by our Lord Jesus Christ. God has caused the saints of God, the blessed people, the people of God, to draw near and approach unto Jesus because our forerunner, the Lord Jesus, has entered within the veil. And now he stands in the glory of God. He stands in the presence of God. And by him and through him, you and I are bidden. And tonight we're called to approach onto the throne of grace, to the high and the holy of God. You see, what the flesh cannot do in weakness, by faith, through Christ, we can, even this very night. We're bidden to come to the thrice holy God. We're bidden to come to the mercy seat. Now, there are different points of application that can be made concerning the cloud filling the tabernacle. We've just applied it in Christ. But, you know, one can also apply it in a personal way because we as Christians are described as temples of the Holy Spirit and dwelling places for the living God. Matthew Henry said, where God has a throne and an altar in the soul, there is a living temple. 
We have it Christ in us, folks. Christ in us, the hope of glory. And we are to be filled, the Bible says, with the fullness of God. But there's another point of application that I want to draw out because not only do we see the glory of God in Christ, not only should the glory of God, you know, fill us, but friends, in a corporate sense, we want the presence and the glory of God to fill this house. I'm sure every believer wants the presence and the glory of the Lord to fill this house. It's something we pray for. It's something we desire. But friends, do we really understand what we're asking for when we ask for God to fill this place with his glory? Do we understand what it would be for God's glory to fill this house? Think of the reaction of the shepherds on the Bethlehem hillside when the angel of the Lord came upon them and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. Listen to their reaction. It says, and they were sore afraid. In other words, they trembled in the presence of Almighty God. And you know, friends, that's what happens when a transcendent God draws near in that special way. An awesome, reverential fear falls upon the people of God. All God's people. We read accounts of revivals and what happened. Some marvelous stories. But you know, friends, in some of those meetings where they sense the glory of God coming down, I tell you, people were lying prostrate on their faces. Not falling backwards. They were lying prostrate on their faces before a holy God. The realization of the radiance of his perfections made them lay low in the dust. And when the glory of the Lord fills a place with his presence, Folks, there is no room for self. Self is shut out, just as Moses couldn't enter in. And this is one of the signs that God is among his people, because it's marked by humility, because self is left outside. Our own thoughts, our own notions must be left outside. You know, friends, our pride can often hinder a conscious sense of the presence of God among us. Now, you know, and I've got to confess, even I see it sometimes. But, you know, friends, just now and again, you know, when certain announcements are made or certain things are said are going to be done, you see eye rolls and smirks and huffs and puffs. You know, friends, that's pride. Because what you re people are really saying is, well, they're not doing it the way I would have done. But you see, self cannot be in the presence of a holy God. You know, friends, I don't know about you, but I just take those words of Scripture and I cry to God, search me, O oh God. Know my heart. Know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. So the cloud filled the tabernacle with the glory of God. But secondly tonight, the cloud furnished the people of God with the guidance of God. Verse 36 of our passage in Exodus chapter 40 and verse 37. Whenever the cloud was taken up from above the tabernacle, the children of Israel would go onward in their journeys. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not journey till the day 
that it was taken up. Now, there is, we won't be looking at it, but there is a more detailed description concerning the guidance of the cloud in Numbers chapter 9, verses 15 to 23. But for the sake of time, we're not going to read that portion. Throughout Israel's wanderings in the wilderness, the cloud and the tabernacle were inseparable. If the cloud was lifted up off it and moved in front, then the tabernacle had to move with the children of Israel. If the cloud stood still, the people stopped and they remained until it moved again. The appearance was of a cloud by day and fire by night so that all could see where the tabernacle was and whether it was stationary or whether it was in motion. Now, the presence of the cloud was necessary because people in of themselves are incapable of knowing God's ways. You know, God's ways are higher than our ways. God's ways are perfect. In fact, we read in, you don't need to turn to it, but I'll read it to you. The verse, Jeremiah 10, verse 23. O Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man who walks to direct his own steps. And you know, just as Israel had to get their marching and holding orders from God, so too we are not to find our guidance from within. We're to find it from above. You see, friends, there's a difference between being led by intuition and being led by divine instruction. God's will lead those who look to him for direction. He always does. Psalm 32 and verse 8 actually says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. You know, folks, you can't go wrong when you look to God for guidance. Simple as that. And walk in the way that he has shown. God leads safely, so we need not fear. And we continue to look to him. I think of that old hymn we used to sing. We sometimes do occasionally hear. He leadeth me, O oh blessed thought. And Israel moved when the cloud moved, but they stayed when the cloud stayed. God did not consult with them as to whether or not it was a convenient for them to move. God did not consult with them over which was the best place to stop. All they had to do was submit to the unfailing guidance of God. Now, remember, sometimes that cloud might have been taken up in the middle of the night. And the people had to be ready to move. You know, friends, sometimes if we're not careful, we can become so stuck in our ways that it, even God, it takes a hurricane for him, to, for him to move us. But Israel moved when God moved. Now, friends, that meant they left. They lived in constant uncertainty. And I've no doubt that the command to move would at times have interrupted some of their plans. You know, if they'd have been a bit stubborn and said, well, I'm not moving. We only set up camp a few days ago and I quite like it where it is. Or if they just said, well, God might be moving on with the cloud, but I think we'll stop here an extra couple of days. But you see, if any of them said that, 
they would have died because they were watered by the rock that followed. And if they'd have stayed, they would have had no access to water. You see, God wants none of his people to settle down in the wilderness. He's given us marching orders, folks, to press on with him and to advance in our spiritual war. But there were times when the cloud did rest for a while. And you know, that resting, it must have tested the patience of those who were restless and wanting to be on the move and get to the promised land wait. But you know, friends, that long wait even didn't leave Israel with nothing to do. Because during the times of waiting, we actually read in Numbers 9 verse 19 that they were to keep the charge of the Lord. And that was the service of the tabernacle. They were to offer the sacrifices and offer the incense. And you and I, friends, we're anxious to move forward. And yet, friends, even if we're in a wilderness experience, we are still to offer up the sacrifice of our praise and the incense of our prayers. We're not to be idle at such a time. We've come together tonight and we're here to engage in the charge of the Lord in praise and in prayer. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I can't think of any time in my knowledge that Israel either stayed behind when the cloud moved or that any of them ever ran ahead of the cloud. They moved as one people. They moved as a single entity together. When the blast of the silver trumpet by Aaron and his sons was given, all the people move together. Let's take that as a word from God. Now, we don't have a cloud tonight directly above us to guide us. But you know, friends, we do have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit to guide our steps and to order us. Paul said, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And you know, friends, to be spirit-filled should make our desire all the more to be baptized in God's Holy Spirit. A spirit-filled believer will be a led believer. So we discovered that the cloud filled the tabernacle with the glory of God. And we've discovered that the cloud furnished the people with the guidance of God. But lastly, the cloud fixed the attention on the grace of God. Look with me back at Exodus chapter 40, our passage, verses 34 to 38, and particularly the last verse there, verse 38. For the cloud of the Lord was above the tabernacle by day, Fire was over it by night in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. You know, friends, it was continual. Think of all the other clouds in the sky. Often those clouds were changed or they were chased away with the wind. But this cloud remained with God's people day and night in all of their journeys. You know, even through all the grumbling, even through all the complaining, the cloud remained with them. What a picture and what a testimony of both the mercy of God and the grace of God. You see, they were accepted by God 
not on the basis of who they were or what they could do, but on the basis of the one that we've seen typified throughout all these studies on the tabernacle, the Lord Jesus Christ. Tonight, my dearest, and that you are my dearest, all of you, brothers and sisters, the fact that God is merciful to us and that he's covenanted never to leave us or to forsake us, you know, friends, that should fix our attention wholly on the grace of God. The pathway for the Israelites at times was tough, but they could always lift their eyes and look at the clouds, and it would have encouraged them. Now tonight, we can look at the one, we can look up to the one who is the author and the finisher of our faith, whose glory inhabits and fills the heavenly tabernacle, and as we view him, we can take courage and find grace as we walk through this sinful world. I pray tonight that the Lord will bless his word to our heart. I pray that he'll have blessed these studies in the tabernacle and have helped and blessed. They've challenged us at times, but encouraged us too. But let's desire more of the glory of God the presence of God in our lives, that we might say, fill this place, Lord, with thy glory at this gathering of thine own. Well, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God tonight. Amen. Praise his wonderful name. Well, actually, I've finished. Is there a